uh, you should always uh, do your own research and consult with professionals. The format tonight is informal. We'd like to allow questions on the fly so that answers can be uh, given in context. Uh, you can use the chat function and I'll try to uh, monitor that um, along the way and we can actually answer <coughs> questions on the chat as we go along. And um, uh, yeah, feel free to use the chat feature and we'll do our best to, to answer those questions as they come up. Uh, so um, uh, Jim Phillips is, uh, is our presenter tonight. He's been uh, working um, working with uh, cold weather survival for decades and has a lot of really neat information and uh, he can definitely save you if you're in a cold weather situation. So, uh, uh, so uh, he's been associated with our organization for, for quite some time as well and we, uh, we're happy to have him with us tonight. So uh, with that, we'll go ahead. We'd encourage anyone, if you've got a lot of noise on your end, uh, please do go ahead and uh, uh, mute your mic. And uh, if we have too much troubles, I might have to do some muting on this end, but uh, we'll go ahead and, uh, and turn it over to you. And uh, we're looking at uh, Jim Phillips' screen and he'll, uh, he'll narrate this as well as uh, go through the, the visual presentation. So go ahead, Jim, thank you. All right, thanks. It's a pleasure to be back here again and share some ideas with folks. There may be a few people who are somewhat familiar with me, but uh, if not, my whole background in teaching in the area of preparedness survival began because of cold weather and winter. And that was my specialty for many, many years. But as I got deeper and deeper into it, you, when you're talking about survival or being comfortable in the cold weather, you have to be talking about nutrition, you're talking about sanitation, you're talking about all these other things. And so it grew into a whole system of what I've been doing now. I began this uh, professional part of my life in 1984. So I've been at it for just a few years. And I am truly officially an old buzzard is what it comes down to. Uh, hopefully, having lived long enough, I've learned a few things. Bottom line is winter happens is what in every year, it's, it's about the same time every year, and we just kind of get used to it coming and going. And when we talk about becoming self reliant, you either going to make provisions to deal with whatever comes in the future, winter being one of them, or you end up becoming a victim. And, you know, since you have the choice to choose your own, if you don't make a choice, then you're going to be crying for somebody to come save you, you know, FEMA, FEMA, National Guard, somebody there, some group, organization, or neighbor. So understand that winter is a very real problem. It can be, and it's quite often really overlooked at how deadly it is because cold happens when you're out there playing. It happens while you're traveling. Uh, it, it, all kinds of ways you can find yourself caught in the cold and people do all the time, but most of the time, nothing really bad happens to most of them, although we do lose about 650 people a year to hypothermia, they die. And there's frostbite and other things there, but it's a very small number of people that occurs uh, because our system is up and running. Well, things happen at home. Uh, How would you like your front door when you open your front door? It looks like that. You know, that's a serious snowstorm there. And or your cars get snowed in, things like that. But here again, we have a system operating around us, so it's not a big deal. Okay, one of the things is that winter really is not taken very seriously. Uh, people are unprepared for winter emergencies. And why is that? Well, first off, we have our ubiquitous utility infrastructure. It's all around us. And somebody's there to fix it if something goes wrong. Natural gas, propane, fuel oil, you know, these kinds of things. We have all this communication. You can call for help and ask for help. We've got our transportation around us. And we got our power grid. And as a matter of fact, the power grid is the golden thread that weaves all of this together. And if the power grid is down, things stop. And, you know, most furnaces are going to take some power to run them, at least to run fans. Uh, some of it's electric heat, but most of it, you know, you've got fans that blow and move heat around. So what is the probability that you will lose your utilities for an extended period of time? This is something that most people don't think about because we're so used to having it. It's, it's like it's a right. It's just always there. Well, you start thinking about it. We got all kinds of natural things going on that can take out sections of it and or can, um, you know, power down over a large put area. Put into effect the use of waterborne tanks we have, uh, have the, increased uh, the popularity. Also, still have available our nitrate and urea finishes for fabric covered background. aircraft. 
One resources. of the other things when we're thinking Aviation about natural. Aviation Maintenance Technician Handbook, General Chapter 8, AC 4313-1B, Acceptable Message, <coughs> Techniques and Practices, Randy. Aircraft Inspection yeah. Repair, Chapter 6. These are free on FA.gov. Just go to FA.gov. You can download a PDF copy. I have a PDF copy of 4313, both 1B and 2B. Uh, it's, it's good reference. A lot of the information in this presentation tonight was taken right from there. So now we're going to do questions. Who is that? Hey, Tim. It looks like most of the questions have been answered. Uh, man, there was a bunch of good questions that came in tonight. Actually, it looks like about 36 questions over the last bit. Is there a couple of them you want to get on? Hey, um, hey, Tim, I got one. Here. It's good for the whole um, group to learn from. Um, Gina actually answered. She gave a great answer. Um, somebody asked, can I use ACF 50 or another way to comply with the FAAB? I'm assuming they're talking about the cruise spar on the 170, Cessna 177. And Gina answered it correctly. Yeah, you may you have, have a button down at the bottom of the people that says mute all. Means of compliance oh, from the that materials. And that'll that mute me. From the AB. Then you yeah. mute me. Oh, yeah. yeah. So now when, and they're, they're right. They bring up a very good point here. If it's an AB, then you need. Okay, I unmuted them. Let me find you, Jim. Okay, can you hear me? There we go. All right, there we go. All right. <laughs> anyway, technical difficulties are always kind of fun. I hate it when that happens when I'm doing these things. We have this other thing that could be a problem. It's a natural one again, and that would be uh, CME could occur. Uh, 1859, uh, Carrington event kind of a thing would really disrupt a lot of us. We, we have a, the human cause things, the economic things. We have, well, this country is a target, EMP being one of those things, as well as this thing that's kind of on our horizon right now about what could occur with some of these people with their fingers on the trigger that could really bring things down, disrupt it. Whether those... Uh, those nuclear strikes are on this country or not, they would be very disruptive to the whole world and would bring down economies and things like that. So anyway, there's all kinds of things that could bring down our utility just for a period of time. Well, if you find yourself in that situation, EMS and the emergency people are not gonna be responding. So my question is where you have all these possibilities, any one of which could bring down our utilities and maybe two or three of them occur at once, Will you be ready to properly respond? And the key word is to respond, or you'll, will you be stuck trying to react to the situation, trying to figure out what the heck do I do now? Now, I was asked here uh, two, little, almost two years ago to write an article. It's on um, Jack Lawson's website in there. And I was asked about for people that are totally unprepared, haven't made any preparations, which shouldn't be anybody on this call, but haven't made any preparations. What can you do just scrounging around the house? This was a follow on to what went on in Texas here, you know, two winters ago that really caught those people by surprise. Who thinks way down south in Texas, you're going to have below zero temperatures? Doesn't happen very often, but are you ready to deal with it? All right. This is a very real need that we have to stay warm. And it's just taken for granted. And if we have a, something occurs, well, we can go get help. You can go down and stand in line to get into the auditorium with 5,000 un other unhappy people. You can go out and stand in the chow line. I, I don't want to be around them. You know, when people are hungry, cold, stressed, things aren't working, they're grumpy. And I don't like being around grumpy people. In fact, some of them become downright dangerous. So I would rather be prepared to deal with these things on my own. That means making provisions. Okay, the winter threat is more than just discomfort. Now, we've all been chilly or cold, but it's much more than that. One of these threats is a very big one that most people do not respect, and that's hypothermia. Hypo, depressed or lowered thermia temperature, so internal body temperature being lowered, and it's very unpleasant. I call it the killer of the ignorant and unprepared. Again, we, we lose about uh, 650 people a year on the average to hypothermia. And you need to learn about this. This is not the class I'm going to give you a great depth in it, but I want to touch on some things because there's a lot of things that are published on my website and by others. You need to understand it. Now, hypothermia is a bigger threat above freezing than it is below zero. 
when it's below zero, we're usually somewhat prepared. When it's only, you know, 38 degrees, sometimes we do silly things and get ourselves caught out there. Wind and rain or sleet without proper clothing and shelter can be very deadly very quickly above freezing. Okay, we have all experienced minor hypothermia. When I'm doing a live class, an audience, I ask people, how many people here have experienced hypothermia? Raise your hands. You know, well, there's three, four, five people put their hands up. Then I ask them the other question, which is how many of you people have ever shivered? All the hands go up. That's hypothermia. Now, it's minor. It's not life-threatening. But it's one of the early symptoms that your body is starting to automatically respond to the fact that it's becoming chilled. This should be a little bit of a wake-up call. You need to understand what the symptoms are, what happens when it deepens, and you need to understand how to act and when to act because hypothermia is very, very problematic. You've got to recognize and correct the problem before you pass the point of no return because once you get, see, we've all been like that guy, kind of huddled up and your teeth are chattering. It's like, but you're going to go someplace where it's warm. You know, this is temporary. But if you're like this young boy that's in a hypothermic coma, he's being rescued. If so, nobody's there to rescue him. He will simply chill out enough till his heart stops beating and he's gone. So you've got to know how to respond to this. Okay. Ignorant and unprepared people. Why is that a problem? First off, hypothermia can be very insidious, especially when you're not expecting it to last forever and you're going to get some, you know, get to a warm place. It can be very subtle because we've all been chilly, we've all shivered, and we've all got through it and we're okay. The problem is it will sneak up on you and you can be in trouble before you recognize it. And it can slip down to the point where you're unable to take proper reactions. I'll help you understand that here. Now, hypothermia is likely the main cause or a contributing factor to all of the other winter injuries and deaths. Here's why. First off, when you're in hypothermia, and as it deepens on this, your cognitive functions, your, your thinking, they slow down. Uh, you become distracted by the cold because it's, you're miserable. You're defocused. You want to get away from it. Uh, you, you people, as you get into deeper hypothermia, you start to slur your speech, uh, you're slow of thinking, your, your uh, reactions, your physical reactions are slow. Uh, and if you're driving a vehicle or working with equipment, when you're slowed down like this, you're a hazard is what it comes down to. I've done a lot of industrial courses with people on that to help them understand why they have more injuries in the winter. Nobody froze to death. Nobody had any frostbite, but they have more hand trap injuries or things like that when people were chilly and cold. This is particularly true of guys. We're tough. We can deal with it. Uh, that can be a wrong answer. You're in a hurry to get away from the cold. When you're in a hurry, you make mistakes and you can't think clearly and your reflexes are not as good and you start to become very, very tired. I teach in depth about hypothermia because I know it from the inside. I've been right on the edge of losing my life to hypothermia one time, and I can tell you all about it. Now, frostbite's the thing we think is a real problem. It is, but frostbite is not as big a problem as hypothermia. However, you don't want to go there. Uh, here's a young lad's fingers, his hands, frostbite. You don't like that. Here's two days after that, what they look like, all the cell damage that occurred, and all the fluid that's leaking under the skin and into the tissues there. He probably didn't lose his fingers, but he's always going to be more susceptible to frostbite in the future because there's lots of internal scarring that occurs around the nerves and the blood vessels and in the flesh, and uh, it's not a good place to go. Here's one that's even worse. There's some feet you do not want to have <clears throat> because those toes are gone. They are truly dead. Now, the main issue with frostbite, now here again, when we have all the medical services around us because now oh, the system's working, frostbite doesn't have to be quite that threatening, but when we have a shutdown system, if you let it get to the point where you've uh, really frostbitten some things, this is a problem. The first problem is you might lose some parts of your body. Now that's what we call auto amputation. That's where those frostbitten fingers, they turn black like those toes, they completely dried up and the body was able to shed them without, in this case, without a terrible problem. Not that this is good, but, uh, that, you know, he lost his fingers. But here's the real problem. Without medical services, if this flesh, which has been damaged, if it gets warmed up and literally it rots on your body, 
then you become septic and now it's amputation and or you die. So you don't want to go there. This is why maintaining, uh, keeping yourself from going into hypothermia, which is going to increase the chance of having frostbite is much more important that you, you just don't let it go there. So you've got to understand it. So that's why I say this is one of the most serious threats you face in the cold is hypothermia. And it doesn't have to be that cold. It doesn't have to be below zero. It doesn't even have to be below freezing for it to be a real threat to you. So we have this need to stay warm. And being cold can be like a big black hole and it can creep up on you and suck you into oblivion. If you're not paying attention, you don't understand how serious it is because you've never been there. I've been there. I understand. All right. So here's what you do to stay warm. Um, move to the out tropics. You can say, well, I'll always stay in a heated structure. Have multiple sources of heat. Never go any place without heat. Well, what's the truth really? What, what can you guarantee? Hey, when the power grid goes down, it's down. Uh, when you get stuck on the road or the cars break down in the cold, that's where you are. Uh, the house becomes damaged for whatever reason, earthquakes in the winter in our area around here where we're, I sit on this big fault. That's a problem. It, utilities and services just get shut down and there you are. So let's talk about living without utilities. Not that we necessarily want to do that, but we can be in a situation where we're caught without the utilities. What do you do? Now, these are the nine areas that I teach in all the time. I talk about those things. As I said in the beginning, it all started with clothing and about being able to take care of yourself. And by the way, a sleeping bag and nighttime bedding is clothing because that's something you wear. But you have to know about the water. By the way, attitude and the foundation area are critically important. Sanitation, if you get diarrhea, dysentery when you're out in the cold, that's a real problem. Nutrition is important. Shelter, all this. So they all come into play. But I started with the cold weather in the winter, primarily for recreation reasons years ago. So without utilities, here what, here's what you can do. <clears throat> and these are things you can be thinking about now and making provisions for because you're likely to lose your utility sometime and maybe for a long time. Well, conserve the heat that you have. How about backup and auxiliary heat? How about reduce the need for heat? How about all of those? And so what's practical? What's reliable? Well, conserve heat. Well, one of the things you can do now, if you have in your house, is you might be able to add more insulation. Usually it's in the attic. That'll help a little bit, while you, you, particularly with your utility bills now. But here's something more important for you to think about and be prepared to do. And that is to reduce the air infiltration into your house. Air infiltration is a big problem. One of my careers that I had early on was designing uh, passive solar homes. And that's where you become really cognizant about air leakage into the home because that steals an awful lot of heat. Warm air going out, cold air coming in, bad exchange. So what you want to have, of course, is the weather stripping you can put in now around windows and doors. But here's for the emergency. You ought to have plastic sheet, a nice, you know, six mil plastic sheet, the kind of clear kind, duct tape, staple guns, things like that so that you can take and put it up over windows and doors that are not being used where you feel all that air that's creeping in there, particularly when the wind is blowing, when it's cold, there's a lot of air that comes into the house will really be stealing some heat. Here's something else you can do to conserve heat. You can reduce the area that you're trying to heat if you're using some auxiliary heat. Now, this is our garage. We have this three-car garage. There's a two-bay and a one-bay, and this is a two-bay over here. And we have this heater out here. We have nine children, a bunch of grandchildren. We're having a Christmas party and we don't have enough room in the house. So we clean out the garage. Notice this arrow over here and you see a plastic sheet there. Here's the other side of it. That's the other bay over there, which is where my shop is. And by putting in a curtain of plastic sheet that goes to the ceiling, drops down to the floor, I can now keep some of this warm air from leaking into that. It's obviously not a good insulated area, but just Doing that will allow you to keep that space much, much warmer, shirt sleeve comfortable out there. All right, so you can do those kinds of things. How does that apply to you and your house? You might want to have this plastic sheet so that you're ready to cordon off an area of your house so you just have heat. If you have auxiliary heat in one area or where everybody's living and doing a little bit of cooking and some lighting that's producing heat, don't try to heat the whole house. Cordon off the, the hallways and things like that into that main living area, you do that. My mother grew up, uh, part of her life was in South Dakota when she was young, and they were heated with uh, coal and wood. They heated one room, 
and the other rooms were closed off uh, in the upstairs where she slept. You know, there was no heat that was up there except what, you know, rose up through the ceiling. And they would have ice on the, the nightstand with the water base in it, things like that. But then by cordoning off that one area, the kitchen and the living room area, they could keep that warm, but the whole house was not heated. People have done that for generations. You can learn to do that again. Some more on conserving heat. And this is where you may want to play with and learn to work with plastic sheet. And buy plastic sheet, buy the 100-foot rolls. Get lots of it. And the duct tape. With staple guns and with uh, battery-powered screwdrivers and things like that, you can put batten board up and put over top of windows and things. If it's going to be long-term, you need to get serious about, hey, power grid is gone. Whatever happened, it happened. I can't fix it. It's just done. And so now you have to respond to that by having the materials in hand so that you can put up the plastic sheet, tape it down, staples, put on bat boards, whatever you need to do to make it as permanent as you can because, well, you're going to be dealing with it. Back up an auxiliary heat. This is something people think about. Well, let's just solve the problem. So you hear a lot about that, getting the, the stoves running the different fuels. Like on the left, those are propane heaters. They are radiant heaters. Very, very efficient. They are consuming oxygen because they're not vented, so you have to be careful about that. You can have all the wood-burning or coal-burning appliances, and you'll store some of those materials. And be sure that you have the fuel to match the appliance and the appliance to match the fuel. I do whole classes in fuels and stoves and things like that, but that's one of the things you can do. But how reliable is it might be the question you ask. Well, if you're going to use some fuels, uh, you're first off you're going to have to change your thinking about this because now you're in, now some people they have the water stoves and they're used to doing this and I've lived where I had nothing but wood heat for a while in a partially built house and it was pretty tough I know what it takes but some homes are set up with that so that you can be heating with uh, wood all the time fine if you are set up to do that no problem for you but for 99.9% .9 of people in this country. This is going to be a big change, and it's going to be a challenge, and it's an attitude adjustment because we're thinking like, I want things to always be like they used to be, and I always had this warm house. I just set the thermostat, but uh, we're no longer in Kansas, Toto, is the bottom line, and you're going to have to adapt to it, and trying to have a constant warm house where it isn't built from the very beginning to be like that on wood or coal uh, or, um, you know, if you have a geothermal heat or something like that, then trying to maintain your lifestyle on wood and coal, it can be very difficult, even dangerous to attempt where the house is not set up for that. So let's talk about making it last, the fuels last. Whatever you have, you have a limited supply because you've got what you've got. What this takes is an understanding that when you're cooking with things, you may have these stoves you can use as a cook stove, while you're cooking and sanitizing things, you'll be producing some heat. That's where that plastic sheet comes in. Hang up the plastic sheets around that area so that most of that heat will stay right in there. So you get into this warm space that you may want to be in for a while, changing clothes, washing, uh, any kinds of things like that. You can be in a warmer space and let the rest of the house be cold. This is a change in thinking. Fuels are important for light. And now, we'll, we have a lot of things right now where they're battery powered and solar powered. Those are nice. But you always want to back up your backup. So if you have the solar powered things, eventually every one of those batteries will die is what it comes down to. The more you use them over time, they all wear out. So you may want to have on a backup as some propane things. You might have some white gas, but you'll never use that inside. Never, never inside. Coal oil, kerosene can be used inside, kind of sooty, but it's okay. Propane could be used inside as long as you're careful about venting. But you've got to be ready to make the switch we're so used to going into a room, flipping the switch, and there it is. You got light. Well, it's going to be different for a while. So what you want to do, again, talked about this before, is significantly reduce the area that you want to be heating so that small amount of heat that you have will be right where you need it. Okay, about making fuels last. And this is where you have to think community. <clears throat> yes, you have your own stores and your neighbor has their own stores. Maybe you can gather some more depending on where you are. But fuel management, in a, when it's extremely limited, is something you have to be very careful about, not making the assumption, well, everything's going to come back within a week, so I'll just burn away. 
Okay. Military and not they're being that. deployed right now. No. There are, in my belief, a lot more deployments than what is actually being said. There are the public deployments, which, you know, they say. Okay, I got myself unmuted there. So what you want to do is with the biomass, and that's what most people will be using, you're going to be collecting wood, scrap wood, you know, firewood in the mountains, brush, any kind of a thing like that. And the, the, the idea is you've got to think community because if there's people around you that are trying to do the same, we can be like, we're going to go to the grocery store and get all the, the toilet paper so nobody else gets it until I can get mine. We might need to be cooperating with each other so we don't get into fighting over this stuff, which won't help anything. So keep that in mind that we very carefully manage our fuels and we help everybody as much as we can. So what you have to understand is, and if you know the story of Easter Island where they used up all their wood on that island and denuded it, you can do that in your area. I think of up north in the Wasatch Front where we have these mountains to the east up there, lots of trees, and there's a million people down there. Of course, they don't have biomass stoves, but still, if everybody's trying to use all that, we'll denude, denude those forests in an instant trying to maintain our lifestyle. Okay, there are some fatal safety facts you have to understand. And I wrote the words funny to say extreme safety think, because you've got to think about your safety, and it's extremely important for us. Previously, there were generations of fire safety experience training that was going on, because that's what we had. We didn't have electricity. We didn't have natural gas and those things for generations, and people were very aware of the problem, and they were still burning down their houses and getting hurt. So our grandparents lived without thinking too much about fire safety, because they lived with it every day. You've got to be extremely sensitive to this. You want to have the, the fire extinguishers and things around you, and you have to watch things very carefully, and especially children, because children, uh, Boy Scouts, anybody who's been around a Boy Scout, you know, they like to run around with burning flames and what have you. They're going to be trying to do that in a house with their candles and other things. They will burn things down, and you also have things that are very flammable in the house, to be a real problem. So you have to really be watching this, especially with children. Not that the adults are all much that much better, but sometimes they can think a little bit more. Here's one that you may not be used to. Here's chimneys that have this creosote buildup in there. And one of the things will build up creosote in your chimney is if you're burning green wood and wet wood, uh, that doesn't burn completely very well and it doesn't burn as hot. Or if you're trying to really conserve your fuel so you choke down the air intake to that, that heater so that not so much heat is going up the chimney and you're not burning as fast and you don't keep the creosote cleaned out of it, and you end up with chimney fires. <clears throat> and if you've ever heard one, you'll never forget it. It roars and it thunders and it's vibrating. And if you're lucky, the only thing it'll do is destroy your chimney. Uh, if you're not so lucky, it'll do far more than that is the chimney disintegrates around that house particularly if it's at night and you're sleeping and it ends up burning down your house or doing great damage. And remember, the fire department is not coming because the system is down. So it's up to you. You'll either take care of yourself or you'll lose it. Something to have on hand to help stop that is there's some of these little chemical sticks that you can throw in the, the fire. Once you hear the fireplace roaring, toss it in there and it'll help smother that, uh, that uh, chimney fire that's going on in there. Uh, so that you do not do the damage. You can also help keep some of the creosote down by getting some of these having on hand and periodically, you know, scouring out some of that stuff. Uh, just be sure you're taking care of your chimney and or sweeping it also. Okay, some other fatal facts. And this is where people are trying to maintain their lifestyle because they haven't made the shift to say the house is going to be chilly. It's not going to be a shirt sleeve comfort all the time. Parts of it are cold. I'm wearing more clothing. You're going to have to adapt to it because if you're trying to push things to their limits, you have a real problem with CO2, odorless, colorless. It's a silent killer. And where you have particularly unvented heaters like the propane and the natural gas that might be unvented into the house, <clears throat> uh, the stoves, the cook stoves and things like that, you're running the natural gas stove on high to heat the house, pouring a lot of CO and CO2 into the house. The safest of the fuels to be burning them inside the house where they may not be vented is natural gas, propane, alcohol, and kerosene. The most dangerous ones you never want to burn inside would be white gas or the um, um, 
Coleman fuels or things like that, charcoal briquettes or those things, because they produce copious amounts of carbon monoxide. Now, by the way, natural gas will produce more carbon di- carbon monoxide when it, it doesn't have enough oxygen to burn cleanly and the flame starts turning kind of yellowish instead of blue. That's an indication it may not be burning completely. The nice blue flame where it's mostly the blue flame with a little tip of yellow, that's clean burning. If you're seeing lots of yellow and actually starting to turn kind of reddish yellow, you're producing lots and lots, lots of carbon monoxide. So your white gas lantern is for outside only, only outside, charcoal, only outside, coal, only outside unless it's vented in a proper, you know, appliance. So be careful with that because the problem with the, uh, the carbon monoxide is that it attaches very, very strongly to the hemoglobin in the blood and it doesn't release it when it goes around to the lungs. Right now, carbon dioxide, which you breathe out when your uh, blood circulates by the lung tissues, the carbon dioxide is released out there, exchanged for oxygen, pull it in. CO, carbon monoxide, doesn't release. It's very slow in getting it out of you. It builds up. And it builds up enough, you simply die because you're smothered. Okay, back up in auxiliary heat. You might want to be thinking about some things you could do right now that will make the loss of utilities not as severe. You can add on to your house, some houses. Again, this is one of my professions. I love doing this. Add on a sun space, a greenhouse that will bring some heat into the house. If it's a large one like this one is right here on this whole south side of the house, This thing is wonderful to be inside of in January and February with the snow on the ground on the outside and it's shirt sleeve warm in there and you got all these plants growing. Wonderful. Add on one of these things right here. You may want to consider doing that. Now's the time to do it. And then one of the other things for your auxiliary heat, no matter what you're using, if you have a a little stove, if you have a fireplace or a, 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 a heater in the house, Or if you have one of those unvented heaters that you might be using in the house a little bit, you may want to move some of that heat around. Having a little bit of electricity, which you could get from a modest size, a small solar system, so that you can run some fans. Fans are very useful to have in the winter to move heat around to where you want it, and also in the summer to move heat around where you don't want it. So think about that. Here's one thing that people think about. Well, I'm going to put in a whole house backup system. And I need you to understand that your your backup system, whatever it is, is no more, when it's tied into the, you know, the natural gas or other places like that, is no more reliable than your current primary utility. So people that put in one of these stand down generators, backup generator, wonderful thing to do for short term. But what people do not understand is if you have one that's on gasoline, well, you can't get to where you get gasoline after a while. So when your stores are out, same thing with kerosene, same thing with diesel. I've got propane. Well, you've got to be able to get to the propane store and they have to be able to get their supplies. Well, natural gas, I'm tied to the natural gas system. What people do not understand is that natural gas most and almost all of the natural gas producers buy their electricity to run their pumps from the power grid because they figured out it was cheaper than producing their own, keeping their crew of people to maintain their generators and to maintain their electricity. So what they've done is they've gone away from producing their own electricity, buying it from the grid. So when the grid goes away, their pumps go down is the bottom line. So keep that in mind. Here's one other thing about having like backup like this. There you are in your neighborhood, and I'm, I'm getting kind of bottom line, maybe a little bit um, over the top for some people, but I just mentioned these things and think about it. You're the only house in the neighborhood after one or two months that has lights. What's that going to be to other people? It's going to be a beacon. In some cases, that's not bad, but it also can be a sign that says, come loot me, I have stuff. Now, that's a pretty harsh thing to say, but you may want to consider that. If you're in a position where you're ready to set up some new things, one of the things I used to do was design passive solar homes, and you make a home that doesn't need any heat. It's warm because it exists. Okay. So for the conventional American home, what is the most reliable solution for extended loss of utilities? Not for a week or two or a month. What about all winter? What about several winters in a row? We don't like to think about that. Most people kind of shut down and say, well, I don't want to go there. I can't think about it. Well, that's okay. You don't have to think about it. 
but we have this need to stay warm is what it comes down to. And about backup heat, you have been misled in some of this. I go to all the preparedness shows and I hear what's being said about things and what you need to buy and get and have. So the standard solution, it's what everybody is being taught about, is totally wrong. And you may not like this concept. Okay. The standard false answer is what you need and what you're being taught about is you need to have, well, because you want to maintain your normal lifestyle. We like our normal comforts. It's a habit we've had. It's a shared ignorance, and it's about having this backup heat. Now, if you're set up to be running off of biomass all the time, and that's the way you do it, then it's going to be no issue for you as long as you can get it. But if you're thinking about, I'm going to put in a wood-burning stove or a coal stove so that I can run for the next three or four years that way, you might need to think about how reliable is that because it needs to be practical, viable, and reliable. And, of course, most people don't have a wood-burning stove or two or three of them, and they don't have the wood supply. Now, this was a student. I was uh, up in upstate New York. They, some folks had me come up there and uh, teach classes and all the things that I do. And one of these students, he took me around his house. He's on 10 acres in a hardwood lot, and he's cutting down the, you know, the trees that are dying and taking care of the dead trees and all. He has a barn full of wood for his stoves. He can do this. Most people cannot do that for the average home. So what, what's the solution? What's the reality? So auxiliary heat for a home. I mean, long-term auxiliary heat for a home. <clears throat> Most households, even short-term auxiliary heat, meaning two or three months, will not work because people don't have the fuel. Now, if you have propane or those things for a month or two or what have you, but short-term, some people can. Most people are not even set up for it to be short-term. What about long-term? I'm talking about this winter, next winter, and the winter after. Long-term for auxiliary heat for most people is absolutely impossible. You can't do it. So I don't teach about things that are impossible. We can talk about the short-term, what you can do. But if you have the standard American house and you're trying to take care of yourself, you've got to have a solution that will actually work for you long-term. So we ask the question, a warm house is a convenient and it's a cultural habit. I love it. I enjoy it on the natural gas that I have. The truth is this. Is it really about keeping your house warm? It's not. It's about keeping you warm, not your house. Your house doesn't care. Now, the water in the pipes do, and the goldfish in the bowl do, and the geraniums in the window do. Well, eat the fish, eat the plants, and drain the water out of the pipes. The house doesn't care is what it comes down to. So what are you going to do? Uh, well... The only reliable long-term solution is clothing. And that's where this all began. And this is very, very unconventional for most people. But I want to make a case for it that you need to be considering this if you're really serious about it. First off, what is clothing? Well, clothing, by my definition, it's personal, portable shelter. And it's your first line and most important line of, sense, uh, of defense against, you know, weather, climate, and those kinds of things. This is a message of hope when it gets really, really bad, you can do it without any utilities of what it comes down to, or very minimal utilities. So there are two kind of separate but converging paths. And this is not really the full close course in the clothing. I'm just going to hint to some things because I've got lots of things that are published and you can come back and get most of them. Most of them are free and you can get them and you can decide if you really want to do this or not. And I'm glad to help you because this is what I do. <clears throat> okay. Here's the two basic conditions, and, and we'll cover both of them here. And if you take care of both of them, then you're good for any condition. First off, let's say for a normal shelter without utilities, typical home on natural gas, heating oil, whatever it is, and it's a secure home, but it's a building without any heat. The utilities are gone. They ain't coming back. The inside of the house is going to be above zero, and you're going above zero. In fact, most of the time, it'll be above freezing. It may be 35 degrees. Well, that's easy. But I'll tell you what, zero is not hard. Zero is quite easy, and you'll have to be in really extreme conditions on the weather outside with not a lot of sun and it's cold and blowing in the north for your house to get down to around zero. Most of the time, it'll be in the double digits uh, and most of the time above freezing. But that's still chilly is what it comes down to. Now, the extreme is this. <clears throat> what if you uh, have exposed conditions where you're living and we would call it an extreme? Now, this is temperatures where you're without shelter 24 seven and you don't have any heat and the temperatures are plus 20 or colder. 
Now, plus 20 isn't all that cold. 24-7, no shelter and no heat. That's extreme. Uh, living and working in Arctic conditions, maybe not 24-7, but where you're exposed, where you have temperatures of, of zero or colder and you have winds and wind chill factors, that's what I've done. I've taught people to do that, and I've done that myself. So why clothing? Well, it's because uh, things happen. They happen on the road. They happen in the bush. They happen at home uh, when we're talking about loss of utilities here, and that's what I want you to be thinking about. You know, these automobiles give us the ability to go out places. They give us a lot of freedom, but we can get kind of far away from home. And if you're traveling in the winter and you don't have supplies in that car, that gal in those skinny jeans walking away from that car, hopefully she doesn't have to go very far. People get caught like this, and every winter we see the news reports and the people are stuck out there and all the truckers and things. Of course, people go like, yeah, but I got this car that I can keep warm with this heater and running the engine. First off, you will run out of gas. Secondly, that tailpipe is deadly dangerous, what comes out of it, depending on which way the wind is blowing and which how hot, how cold things are and how much you're running it. And um, so you got to be careful. People die every winter. We lose them in their cars from the exhaust fumes. So when I talk about proper clothing is the answer. This is not a theory. My mission is to reach and teach as many people as possible about winter can be an ally and it's not an enemy. And this is based on more than 55 years of personal experience. In fact, I think I need to change that date on or I think it's 60, more than 60 years now. My first winter snow camp was in 1957. I'm 10 years old. I'm at home. We went winter snow camping. We'd been camping in the winter, but we went in the snow. That was awful. <clears throat> but we kept doing it and go, doing more and longer. And Jay mentioned at the beginning about Boy Scouts because my father was a scout master. And we just went and did. And But we were doing it the, I'll say, the white man way with the layers and the long johns and all those things. And it was tough, but you could do it. But when you look at the old pictures... We always, always, always had fire, lots of fire, mountains of firewood, because it was a fire that made it possible to get through when you were out there for days and days. We started going on snowshoe trips higher, and there's a whole story behind this. I won't give you right now, but it's published about how we converted from having to use fire to where we didn't use any fire. So now I can go camping without any fire. I don't have a tent, don't need a tent, and can go out there and live in extreme conditions on top of mountain peaks, above the Arctic Circle. And my first trip above the Arctic Circle was in 1968. My father and I spent two weeks up there living out of a backpack. The coldest temperature we saw was 30 below zero, and the highest temperature we saw was 10 below zero. Uh, we'd been camping colder than that in the Rocky Mountains. I've been above the Arctic Circle five times in winter camping, never been there in the summer. I, I don't imagine the summer's any good at all. The winter's great because it's not crowded. Okay. Making realistic choices. What, what's really going to work for you? What, how are we going to finish this off? Because I'm talking about some really weird stuff here for most people that's way over the top. Some people may say this, well, I'm not worried about it because I never get cold. <clears throat> well, you've never been cold yet. And I've seen some tough guys say, I never get cold. And I've been with them and taken them into conditions where they are getting cold because they just don't get cold. Well, and now they do. I've got it covered with what I have. Okay, maybe. I, I just need to beef up my layers. Just get some more of these layers things because layers taught like it's a religion. I'll tell you what, when it's extremely cold, I do not use layers. That's another story for another time. But if you're saying I'm tired of getting cold and or I'm afraid that I'm not really prepared to deal with how bad it could get, like the folks down in Texas, we, a lot of them lost their lives. A lot of people were certainly uncomfortable and injured down there. It can happen to anybody. And you say, well, I'm never going to go up north. I live in, well, I live in Texas. Well, that didn't work out for them. And people travel and we have family and you may be moving around and you get caught. So you need to be prepared. Okay. <clears throat> I've got winter clothing. Well, uh, get wet, get cold. How long can you stay out? Uh, how about if you go without utilities? What if you don't have heat and you don't have shelter? Now, there's a test for this, and some people say, I'm just not going to do that. Well, what if it happens? See, my thinking is this. If I'm prepared for the worst, then no matter what happens, it will be an adventure. And I think in terms of worst-case scenarios, not because I want it to happen, but because I just want to be prepared because I've tried pain and suffering. I found out I don't like it. So 
Here's a simple test you can do. Wherever you live or wherever you think you might be in the cold, get the best that you've got of your clothing. Go outside. Now, when my daughter and I were outside, this was it was it was around zero. That was just on our front yard out there. Got off the lawn chair, went outside, take a headlamp and go read a book for the whole night. If you can sit around in your clothing at coldest temperatures you're going to see and not get cold. Now, I'm just in the clothing. This is not a tent with a heater and all. This is my clothing. That means you're on the right track to be able to deal with severe conditions. Well, and you say, well, I don't have that clothing. Well, get in your sleeping bag in realistically, really cold temperatures and be sure that it works. You need to know that it works. Don't read the stupid hang tag. They're useless. A 30 below zero sleeping bag, you ought to try it at 10 above and you'll probably be shivering in that sucker. Been there, done that one. Now, what's come out of this over all these years and the experience is what's called PALS. It's the Philip Arctic Living System. And I'm not going to teach that to you here. And I'm not trying to convince you to become a snow camper. But what I do want you to understand is if you can go into extreme conditions and be comfortable there, and you might want to play with it a little bit and so that you'll know that if I lose utilities at my house, I'm prepared to deal with it. I trained and outfitted uh, Jim Lovell, commander of uh, Apollo 13. He wanted to take a, a North Pole expedition with two of his buddies. They went up there to the North Pole. He had some nice things to say about our system and our clothing. Uh, 1989, uh, the best, best of what's new in technology for the clothing that was in there. So it has some history behind it. It has some depth. And thousands of people have made clothing because that's what I do is I teach people to make it. And I'd like to go back into manufacturing one of these days, but that's kind of another story for another time. You can do this if you want to, to take care of you. Okay. You need to understand that winter can be an ally rather than a threat. Knowledge, K equals I times E. That's my little formula I've used for years. Knowledge is information multiplied by experience. I'm giving you some very brief information here you could gain the experience to know that under these extreme conditions, this was on a snow camp up on a ridge where we had 90 mile an hour winds. We were, and we weren't below zero at that time. We were uh, five, 10 degrees, 90 mile an hour winds, and we were living outside. And I filmed it, by the way, you can watch uh, some interviews of those students if you want to. It's not just about comfort. And there's many, many benefits to being able to take care of yourself. Here's some benefits. When properly prepared for the cold and extreme conditions, you need to understand this, <clears throat> the availability of water in most places. Now, some of these mountain peaks that I used to go to, there's no water on top of those peaks. You got to haul it with you and water's heavy. In the winter up on those peaks, there's snow all around me. I can turn that into water I can consume. So the availability of water is really important. This cuts down on the street people and the roving gangs. You know, where are they going to go? Well, they're going to go to Florida and, and Phoenix and Southern California and places like that. You'll see the Harleys rolling in there in a long string of them. You won't find them in the Uinta Basin in the winter. They won't be there. So there are some advantages to keeping out some of the roving gangs and people there. Okay. No flies, mosquitoes, and other insects. That cuts down on some of the disease and discomfort. Another thing, this is kind of a harsh thing to say, but in the winter, if there's something very serious that's going on in the long term, there may be a lot of death of all kinds of animals out there. And they're going to be, the refrigeration will take care of them for a while so you can more properly take care of them, dispose of them. That's a little over the top for some people. But it's a reality. So I mention it. Think about it. The other thing is this can stop the spread of sickness and disease. Now, it can work, work both ways. If you see... If you crowd together in that gym and that auditorium where they have some heat and you got 2,000 people in there sneezing and coughing on each other, the cold is going to cause, or the fact that you're driven indoors with the cold is going to cause you to get sick. You go live in an igloo in the middle of winter, you don't get sick. Well, I'm not going to go live in an igloo. What I'm going to do is let my house get cold. Two reasons. There's two advantages to that. Number one, I know how to live in a cold house and... Nobody wants to come visit me if they're not prepared for the cold, so they're not going to bring their sickness and disease to my house. So I stop the spread of the disease and those things. And that when you, people are sick and they may be sneezing or coughing, most of those, uh, those uh, pathogens die very quickly in the cold and they don't spread. The cold buffers you from disease is what it comes down to. Okay, if you learn nothing else from tonight, 
this will be the most important thing you need to learn. And I'd like to spend, I could spend an hour explaining this in great depth, the importance of hydration. Hydration, hydration, hydration. You dehydrate very seriously in the cold. In fact, you dehydrate as fast at 10 below zero as you will dehydrate 110 above zero. Different mechanisms, but just take it as a fact right now until you come to some of the classes and I spend more time. You need to understand that the primary trigger to hypothermia when you're at least a little bit prepared to deal with the cold is going to be the fact that you dehydrate because your furnace goes out. Now, this is about being ignorant and arrogant, not understanding this, not recognizing the symptoms of the dehydration of hypothermia, not understanding the physical processes involved. And it saps when you get into this, both the dehydration and especially the hypothermia that's going on. It saps your physical, mental, and emotional strength, and you want to give up. And recovery is very, very slow, hours to days. And if you don't do it right, you lose it anyway. All right. Most people in the winter are chronically dehydrated. That's something most people, they don't recognize it because, well, they haven't died from it. Here's the problem. In the winter, people are running around saying, I got all these chapped lips, you know, and they're smearing the gookum all over in there so their lips aren't as chapped. What I tell my students is, what you need to do is just drink more water, lots more water. They think they're drinking enough. You're not because you dehydrate in the cold. They drink more water and they come back and say, hey, I don't have chapped lips anymore. See, what the body's doing, the physical processes, it's, it's taking some of the moisture that's inside the body elsewhere, and it's trying to conserve that moisture so it's going to take it away from the skin that gets dry and flaky, and from the lips and things like that. Plus, now you got a little wind and uh, some sun on them and what have you that makes them a little more susceptible. People are dehydrated, and they don't recognize it. Okay, nor do they appreciate the ramifications of the risk. Now, if you've been to one of my classes, there's a few people I know have seen this story before when I tell this picture. This is 1973. I you know, lived in Blackfoot, Idaho at that time. I had a Boy Scout troop. <clears throat> and when I have a Boy Scout troop, what I do is what I was taught to do. We always go on a survival trip in the fall. Uh, and we go out and we eat a lot of nothing and hang out and make wilderness beds or what have you. I mean, we live in primitive conditions. No specialized clothing, nothing. What we take is flint and steel. Uh, a, a no, no, we're going to use charred cloth. We're not going to use something that's high tech like steel wool or those things. No, it's flint and steel and charred cloth because you can make that. You can create that. You need to understand that. And a tin can. Now, we'll use that for, uh, in most cases, boiling a little pine needle tea or something like that. You got your regular coat and those things. Now, my ability to take this trip got delayed. I was working out at the National Reactor Testing Station. Uh, I'm on the Arco Desert, and my schedule kept getting changed, and I had to put off this trip, but we are going to take a survival trip. So instead of October and November, where I would normally want to go, uh, we're going to end up in the first, second week of December. Now, this is the lava flow, if you're familiar with it, the lava flow between Blackfoot and Idaho Falls, halfway in between. I'd been flying over that because I was taking my flying lessons, getting my license, I love flying over and I looked at it and said, boy, that'd be a good place to take a survival trip because that's really rugged. This is different. I've been on lava flows, but I hadn't been on that one. So we're going to go there. And I started getting calls from the parents once I had set the date and it was fixed because the weather reports are coming in that the Yukon Express is coming. They're predicting temperatures as cold as 20 below zero or colder. We're going without sleeping bags, no specialized clothing. We're going to go out on that desert exposed, and I'm taking these kids out there. Now, the responsibility for those children has been transferred from those adults, their parents, to me. I've been given the authority, but I now have the responsibility to take care of them, and I will be held accountable if I don't bring some of them back alive. So <clears throat> this is very serious. But I tell you this story because I want you to remember when I'm talking about hydration, how critically important it is. Now, I don't, do we see the snow out there? This is the reason I know we could do it because we've got snow out there. It's been cold and we've got water because we need water. Hydration is critically important. We also have a lot of wood. You can't see it here, but there's a lot of cedar trees and, and sagebrush and things out there. I have these kids gather a mountain of wood. They thought I was crazy. Um, but I know it's going to get cold because this thing is moving in that night. So we have this mountain of wood. 
we have this kind of this where this lava tube had been and there's a collapse area there. It doesn't go back very far at all. It's just kind of that's the mouth of it. But we can build a fire out there in front and we can keep the chill off of us and mostly sit up all night drinking water and talking and getting some catnaps. Here's the story. <clears throat> Johnny, little John down in front, he was one of these kids that was ballistic all the time. He's bouncing around and chattering and moving, and he can't sit still. He's just moving and talking, what have you, all the time. That's his normal way of doing it. Now, when you start to understand the um, hypothermia and how it's affecting people on this, after a little while that evening, I noticed that he's not so active. In fact, he's not chattering. He's not moving. He's sitting kind of hunched over. What I've been telling those boys to do, and I'm trying to drive them and teach them to do is drink water. They've got those coffee cans on that fire, melting snow, melting snow, melting snow, drinking water. And I'm telling them, drink, drink, drink. I'm watching them. Now I can't catch little Johnny drinking. I've been, I trying to keep an eye on all of them. And I notice he's getting into this really kind of a quiet, sullen mode, not moving very much, not chattering and everything. And so I really pay attention to him. I know everybody else is doing okay. I know he's not. He's going into hypothermia. I confront him. I say, I, I haven't seen you drink for a while. Have you drunk? Oh, yeah, yeah. Just had a drink. I didn't see him drink. So I, now I watch him. I don't take my eyes off of him. After a little while, he's not drinking. And I confront him again. And I tell him, you're not drinking. You've got to drink. You must drink to stay warm. You need to drink this water. Well, I don't like it. It's kind of smoky and it has some ashes. And I don't care. Strain them out with your teeth. Drink. He says, well, I'm, you know, I, I don't want to drink. And so I keep trying to teach, but there's a time when the teaching is over because the responsibility is mine and the accountability is to take care of him. He finally confronts me. He says, I'm not going to drink. It tastes bad. It's smoky. It's got ashes in it. And you can't make me. You're not my dad. Done teaching. I grabbed him up. I'm a little bigger than he is. I grab him up. I lay him down on the ground firmly. I kneeled across his shoulders and little Steve Parks is over here. That's him right here. And I tell Steve, bring me that water. Now, all these scouts are standing around because their eyes are big. Phillips is going to kill Steve or is going to kill uh, Johnny here. I'm going to get him some water in him and he's got to drink. I have to convince him to drink. So uh, he brings over that can of water. And now let me tell you, when you pry their mouth open, do it with a stick. Then little bounders will bite you. And so that was one of my lessons I learned on. So you pry it open with your, your stick. You get in the corner of his mouth so he can't close. You start pouring water down him. I'm going to convince him he will drink. Now, some people are going to say, this is childhood abuse. No, letting him die, that's abuse. I ha I, there's no radio. We don't have any cell phones. We either make it or we don't. I have confidence we can do it. Okay, Johnny comes back. Nobody's hurt. Nobody has frostbite. Everybody has a little bit of hypothermia. They've been chilled and cooled and what have you. That night in Blackfoot, it was 20 below zero. In Idaho Falls, it was 25 below zero. We're halfway in between, so it's somewhere between 20 and 25 below zero. No sleeping bag, no tent, and no specialized clothing. We came back, nobody was hurt, but we were cold at times. Water got us through along with that fire. That's how critical it is. I need you to understand that. That's why I tell that story. Even if you have to get rough for somebody, they've got to drink or they will, in fact, die. All right. Winter happens. Be ready for it. Uh, you'll either live providently making provisions for all these things we talk about and, and making proper provisions in all areas so you can face the future with hope and confidence. That's what it's all about. My statement I already told you. There's no doubt to tomorrow will come and there's no dispute that things happen. But how you're prepared to meet tomorrow will make all the difference in the world. If you're prepared for the worst, then no matter what happens, it will be an adventure. I've had wonderful adventures. I've had a few things that were coming close to taking my life out, but it's been wonderful adventures. I've made it so far. True preparedness is based on principles, understanding how and why things work, the physiology and the physics of this world you need to know. It's not a list of things to buy and stuff to store. Yes, you need them. You've got to do that. But what you know is more important than what you have. So preparedness is, why, is a lifestyle I like to call provident living where you test and try and have fun and play with and experiment and these things. Do it for all the positive reasons. Don't do it out of fear. Uh, don't, don't do it out of worry and wringing your hands over, or so are we going to war or what have you. Just be ready. Do all the things you need to do. So I would invite people to come to my website, which is gemsway.com. That's my website. 
There's a lot of things on there. You can register for the newsletter, which is the Provident Living Times. In the newsletter is a link every week. I send one out at the beginning of the week to the link that I do on Wednesday nights. I do a live class, a Zoom class online. And then Saturday mornings, I have an open forum Q&A. There's a link to my YouTube channel. I have done some things on Facebook. I got to get back to it. But right now I'm a one man show and I'm having a hard time getting everything done. There's lots of classes on there that you can watch at your leisure. I would encourage you to do that because there's no cost for the majority of them. Here's a book if you want to learn more about hypothermia. Jack Lawson asked me to write a chapter on hypothermia in it for his book. This is a big book. It's uh, 960 pages or something like that. 20 of those pages in there or uh, my chapter on hypothermia, which he appreciated. says the best one he had ever seen. It wasn't complete, though. I was a little frustrated. I sent him 40 pages. He only printed 20, so there's some stuff missing. Here's some things on winter. These are free links in there. If you go into the section that's on uh, on clothing and there's you know, disasters happen in the winter, kind of what we've done here, but a short one, looking at things a little differently. Here's those uh, those uh, six snow college participates and the blizzard up there. It's screaming, howling blizzard. Uh, you hear what they have to say. Here's the history of PALS, kind of the story behind it all. And then uh, one of my students, we recorded a thing with them about their experience when they did this for the first time out there. Uh, you can go to uh, Jack's website here. The link's in the, the, um, on my website in there in the clothing area. It'll take you there because he want me to write an article. on what, what would you tell people to do in extreme cold? This was right after the Texas incident. They're not prepared. They haven't done anything. What would you do with what you can scrounge up? Well, I scratched my head over that and gave some ideas and that things you can do, which I've talked a little bit about them here. If you find some plastic sheet and some blankets and things like that. Now, there's more you can learn because I published for years on DVD, but I no longer do this, publishing the clothing class. Uh, the, this is uh, an overview to it. And here's a class that has 11 hours of audio instruction, a lot more depth than I gave you here, plus some video that goes with it. This is all going in my members library along with the class, which is Winter Without Worries, where you'll find these things in there. Now, this to give me a little bit of cash flow so I can pay for what it is that I'm doing it's $5.99 a month. I appreciate it when people subscribe to that. That'll give you these classes plus more and more that's coming. My sanitation classes in there, four hours on that. There's five hours on water in greater depth than you'll see any place else. Plus, I've got some more to add to them. I like publishing online because I can add more to it and go greater in depth. And I can also, you know, when I learn something new, I can fix it. So these are supporting members, gives me a little cash flow because I like to buy things and tear it apart and break it. Okay. I hope this gives you some ideas. And this was not meant to, to be the in-depth class to teach you all these things because we could spend, I could spend an hour on water alone for all of the physiology, the physics and why and what the problems are. Any one of these sections, we can spend a lot of time. That's why I publish online. If you want to learn in depth, you can go to my website and do it. You can also uh, come to the Saturday morning Q&A and ask any question you want about anything. But I'll just switch over to any questions that people have now and um, let you ask. I see on the chat here, first sign of dehydration is uh, you're sick to your stomach. Can be, not necessarily. Um, one of the things that happens when you're getting very, very dehydrated, you can become kind of nauseous uh, because your, your, your digestive system is shutting down. And particularly, you try to eat things when you're getting very dehydrated. You don't necessarily have the digestive juices and things like that to take care of it. And so you can feel a little bit nauseated. Some people will just feel nauseated and they'll get a headache. That's one of the other things. You get a headache uh, when you're getting kind of dehydrated. But the other thing most people won't recognize, you're getting chilly. You're getting cold if it's in the cold. Um, on that um, trip that I talked about, the, uh, the, the Cheneys, when they did uh, that um, uh, audio that I have on there, uh, the, cold, uh, the winter experience, whatever it is, the uh, winter without worries experience right here, this one here, they recorded that. <clears throat> uh, Jim Cheney woke up in the night. Now, he has the foam sleeping bag. He has the PALS clothing. And we're out there and it's only, it's like, uh, it's not even below zero. It was 10 degrees or something like that that night. It wasn't extremely cold, disappointing. But uh, he was in the night, he woke up in the middle of the night and he was, he was cool. He wasn't cold. He wasn't shivering. He was just like, his feet were a little chilly and he was just a little bit chilled and he's sleeping inside this 
this sleeping system that will take care of you at 50 below zero, he's going like, why am I cool? And then he remember the classes I talked about and the fact that when you become dehydrated, you will start to get chilly. We always take our water bladders and our bottles to bed in there so we keep them from freezing. Also, so you can drink in the night because if you're getting dehydrated, you'll get chilly. So he got his water bottle out and he drank down a pint of water. And after a few minutes, circulation's back and everything's flowing, goes back to sleep, sleeps the rest of the night. You will get chilly is one of the things that will happen. So there's a lot of symptoms to dehydration, headache, chapped lips, dry, flaky skin, bloody noses, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, just a general mal malaise. You'll just kind of feel kind of, and you get tired. You don't have the energy that you have. And you'll blame it on other things. You need to drink water and more water than you think, particularly in the cold, because you're dehydrating more rapidly than you expect. It's laws of physics that cause that to happen. Uh, let's see, anything else? <clears throat> well, thanks for going on the website and information there. And I'll be putting up more. And I'm trying to publish things. My, my classes I do on Wednesday nights, I publish them in there. Oh, yeah. You went to Basin for camping. A wonderful place to go. Uh, let's see. I'll open this up a little bit more. Yeah, keep your, well, <laughs> keeping your cat warm or your animals warm, you have to have a warm place for them uh, or a place that's not too extremely cold. And so, yeah, that becomes a challenge, but you can do that in a small area is what it comes down to. Um, let's see. Oh, yes. I love some of the comments here. So on. Um, we live completely off grid. Great. You you don't have to deal with these things. If you're prepared to deal with it, that's hypothermia. Um, uh, hypothermia book title. Okay, that was this one. Now, it's not on hypothermia. There, where you'll get a lot on hypothermia is in my class. Uh, I'll, I'll show you those two things. One of them is in the uh, the Winter Safety Made Real, which I'm putting into the members area. It's not right there. It's not there now because I talk in depth about my hypothermia experience that I wrote about in Jack Lawson's book and um, uh, talk about the symptoms in there and a great depth in there. The book that I showed that was on hypothermia a little bit in there is this, the Civil Defense Manual, Jack Lawson's. Oh, and I was going to say, if you want to buy that book, since I wrote the chapter that's in there, I got some of them at a big discount. And online uh, and the regular price, it's, it's, I don't know, it's $94, $96. Um, if you will become a member for the $5.99 a month, and if you want to do it for a short period of time and then unsubscribe, that's okay. But if you're a member, that book is $30 off while I have the supplies that I do. So that'll help you a little bit. How do you make foam clothing? Uh, that's where the class is Winter Safety Made Real. Is, no, excuse me, the uh, Winter Without Worries is all about making foam clothing. And going through that, I'm going to finish publishing that this year. Uh, and as we get into winter, that's what I'll be doing as we go along here. I've already have the first four chapters are in there, four sessions. I've got more to go. Uh, footwear, sleeping bag, everything from head to foot. Well, I'm hmm, the more than I can read here is what it comes down to. Um, let's see something else. Really. And for one thing, if somebody wants to try and answer things here, just unmute, ask a question. I'm trying to read these things. Okay, yeah, using a tent inside, that helps a lot because if you, here's one of the things. You remember we see the old four poster beds with the curtains around them. People think, well, that was for privacy. No, in the old castles, in the old, they didn't have central heat. And their bedrooms were cold is what it came down to. So those four poster beds, they had a top over top of them, a canopy up there, an insulated canopy. And those were insulated curtains on the side, blankets on the side, because even though it's not heated in there, the fact that you're in there breathing and your body heat traps some of the heat in, and you'd be surprised how much warmer it is in there. Now, it's not toasty warm, and, and this is like inside of a tent in your living room. If you're sleeping and living in that tent, you'd be inside the tent. The tent is chilly, but when you step out of the tent, it's like, it's cold out here. And that's just a piece of fabric that'll hold the heat in. So that's one of the things that you do. That's what I talked about in uh, that article that I wrote for Jack Lawson 
uh, about if you're caught. If you have a tent, set it up and get inside the thing with your blankets and sleeping bag. It will be warmer and the air will be more stabilized inside of it. Yeah, please spread the word on this, what we do here. I, I appreciate talking to this group because of all of you people across the country and those that come to my website and attend the classes and share things. I appreciate that very much because that's my mission is to reach and teach. Yeah, how do you make foam clothing? It's you can there's sewing techniques, there's gluing techniques. That's what my class is all about, is teaching you to do that. It's also how to um, uh, be able to um, um, identify the right foam. That's a real challenge. We go through that. I do have foam, but I also teach people how to find the right foam because not all foam was created the same. One of the comments on here, number one, aid is to buy the book. I've taught about this for years, Deep Survival. You need that book. Everybody get that book. Critically important book. This is about your edit attitude. This is about getting your head right. When I talk in these nine areas here <clears throat> about uh, the the foundation, foundation for your well-being is your head and your heart. So when we talk about, there we are, I'm trying to find my picture. Nope, the wrong picture. I'm trying to find a picture here because I, I want you to remember this. Foundation is about your attitude. It's about how you think. It's about your outlook. It's also about building relationships. It's about community. This community that I'm talking to, you folks that belong to this group, and, and I'm hopefully you're forming groups around you because you're, you can't do this alone in the long term. We, we've got to understand this is not the lone wolf time to do things. You need families around you. And if you've ever really got into a tough situation, having people to help you and nothing else, have somebody to talk to that's intelligent so you don't go stir crazy. That helps. But if it's a really bad shutdown situation, you're going to be needing to stand guard over what you have. Not that I'm stingy about things, but my first responsibility is to my household, to my children, to my wife, to my children, my grandchildren, my great grandchildren, and then to anybody else that I can help. But I've got to protect things for them. And I'll do my best to help people. At least I can teach them. I can show them what to do. If somebody doesn't know how to start a fire without a match, I can show them to how to do that. I can even give them some matches for a while, but I can't, I cannot supply the world. So it's important that you develop a community around you. And that's one of the things I'm doing now. There's people that are setting up classes with me, just like we've done here. I've got this group here in New York or wherever it is. Would you be willing to come on and do a Zoom class? I used to have to fly there and do that, and they had to pay my way. That was expensive. I do Zoom classes all the time for free. This is what I do. I hope somebody will come back and subscribe, but you know, if they don't, that's fine. My mission is to reach and teach in all of those areas, water, sanitation, the whole bunch of them. By the way, nutrition is an area that I'm getting ready to do some classes there because what we're being told about nutrition, what to eat in store, absolutely wrong. That'll irritate some people. Anyway, um, your attitude, your outlook is critically important. Deep survival is the textbook for you. And you need to have that. I go through that book every year, once or twice, three times a year. I have it on audio because I don't have time to sit down and read it, but I can be out in the garden working on things. I, I can be uh, driving when I'm in, not in traffic and I can be listening in the background. So get deep survival, get the audio and um, go through it. And then there's other books I talk about. In fact, there's some uh, book reviews that I do on my website uh, that there's uh, nine of them in the foundation or nine, nine sessions with more than one book and a book review. Uh, let's see. Let us some. Yep. Natural gas is susceptible. Uh, and by the way, if I don't get a question answered here, you can go to my website uh, and uh, through the website in there, you can email me. I'll be glad to answer things as best I can for it. Um, and so you can email me anytime to my, just go to the website, jimsway.com in the contact in there, which is in the more section in the menu and just send me an email. I'll, I'll answer things. I'm a one man show, so I'm a little slow, but I'll get to it. Uh, where do you get the audio deep survival? Where I have it is on audible, uh, the subscription to the audible. I do a lot of books on audible. You, you can also buy the, uh, the, at least I've seen in the past that you could buy it on a CD but I have it as a downloadable audible file. Uh, let's see. 
need to build a resilient community. Absolutely. In fact, there's some there's some good books. A lot of you may be familiar with this because of the group that you are. Um, the one second after. That's about developing community. That's that's actually a very good book. In fact, that book is more than just an adventure and what have you. There's a lot of things in there to get you thinking about all kinds of stuff. I highly recommend a One Second After. The other book that is excellent to read is um, Patriots. Um, um, James Wesley Rawls. That's a good one to, to read, to get, have them. Uh, and when people want me, I have some people that are around me. So, well, I'd like to kind of be a part of what you're doing. And I want to be, you know, with you or things like that. I, here's some books you're going to have to read. I can't help you if you don't read these books. So if you want to be somebody that I'm really working closely with, there's five books you're going to read. If you, I don't read books, can't help you. Okay. Just blunt, can't help you. Uh, if you're not willing to read or learn how, now if you're blind and they don't have them in Braille, okay, then there's an audio book. I'll help you. But you need these books because you've got to get some things inside your head and your heart, and you're going to have to face some things. I'm, I'm not a gloom and doom guy. But I'm serious about the probability of things getting really, really bad one day. Loss of power grid, that's all we have to do. Loss of power grid will do exactly the same thing as a total economic collapse. We all end up in the same place. <clears throat> and some of these things are on the horizon. I hope they don't happen. I don't want them to happen. Uh, but m the fact that I don't want them to happen, I'm not going to count on them not happening. Because here's the one of the, the things I want you to understand is you want to put yourself in a position where you can afford to be wrong. You can afford to be wrong. So you do all of this preparedness stuff. Your neighbors laugh at you and say, you goofy guy, one of those prepping guys, you know, survivalists and what have you. Fine. If nothing happens, I was wrong. Hallelujah. And I'm grateful that I was wrong. Although I'll tell you this, if you live long enough, you won't be long, but you know, I'm getting old enough. Maybe I don't have to deal with some of these things, but uh, it, it is extremely important that you prepare for the worst things that you can think of. The worst thing you can think of is all I need is my 72 hour kit and I'll just go bug out and hang out the, the, um, you know, the gym with other people. Okay. If that's where you are, that's fine. I'm not going to put you down for doing that, but you have to be right. See, if you say, it's not possible for the power grid to be lost from an EMP. You have to be right. You have to be right. Because if you're wrong, you're not going to make it. Uh, it's, it's not possible that there will be a nuclear strike, even though it may not be a full nuclear exchange. It, it cannot happen to this country. You have to be right. Because when we have one of those devices, I'm talking blunt right now. There may be some people bail out because they don't want to hear this. I, I apologize. But um, since I know some of the topics that this group has covered, I will just tell you bottom line things. And if I sound a little wacko, I'm actually a very positive individual because I believe in the future. I want the future. It's just that on my way getting to the future, I really don't want to suffer any more than I have to. There's been a lot of pain in my physical pain in my life. I don't like it. So I'm going to try to avoid as much of that as I can. So the chances of there being a, a, a nuclear strike someplace in the world is pretty darn high. And if they're going to do it someplace, they'll probably do it more than one place. And so that brings into the probability of an EMP that brings in, maybe we'll blow up a few things, full global nuclear exchange, probably not. Don't have to do that. All you have to do, in fact, shut down this country. All it takes is, you know, three MP devices launched over the U.S. and two of them go off. We're done. But if you're prepared, and that's why I'm so big on this, you need to rebuild so that we come back. I'm not you're done, meaning we're all going to die. I mean, we don't have the lifestyle we had. Now you, because you're prepared and you have the right attitude, we work together, we rebuild, we come back. And we do better than we did before. Okay, Jay, am I getting too far? And by the way, I'll stay here as long as people are hanging on. When you say it's time to go or everybody signs, I'm done. Because I just dedicate my time to people to do this. As long as we've taken the time to be here, I'll be glad to answer questions. Yeah, preparedness is not a selfish endeavor. We prepare to help other people. I cannot feed everybody. I cannot give them everything they need, but I can still be around to encourage them and teach them and show them. Uh, RG's got their hand up. 
Yes, I've enjoyed your presentation. I live in Texas and uh, the storm caught me by surprise, uh, the ice storm, Yuri. And so uh, I did a lot of things that uh, you mentioned as far as using plastic. And I also put up old clothes into the windows and cut down the drafts and it really does work. I just wanna say that I think um, the idea of resilient communities uh, is more appealing to people and it helps get away from kind of the, the selfish survivalist uh, yeah. uh, you know, argument. And, and a lot of the things that are proposed by uh, the preparedness community um, are positive to do, whether it's uh, a bad situation or a good situation. So eating right is, or planting a garden helps the environment, cuts down you know, your costs. And if something happens like a depression or, or worse, then it can help keep you alive. So there are a lot of things that we can encourage people to do that are good for them, wherever it's bad times or good times. So yeah. I, I really thought your, your presentation was very well done and I'm very grateful for your service to the community and the nation. Um, oh, somebody said, uh, thank you very much. I mean, you're right. And that was that you have some good experience. And what we do with the experience that we um, have is we um, learn from that and say, okay, I made it through that hurt a little more than I'd like to. So I'm going to do a little better with some of the things I can put in store. And also I'm going to go learn some things. So I'm better prepared to deal with it. So uh, comment says, don't see civil defense book on uh, jimsway.com. It's in the members area, I guess is where it is in the members where you get the discount. Uh, if you, if you, you know, don't want to join, you can buy it on, um, you go to uh, civil defense manual. Well, let's see, let me go right here where I put this up. So I remember um, it'll be on civildefensemanual.com. That's where my article is. And there we go, civildefensemanual.com. You'll buy it there. It is 90, it's either 94 or $96. But if you go to become a member for the $5.99 uh, and a month and buy it there, it'll be $30 off. Uh, and then, you know, if that's all you want to do, well, unsubscribe. I got, you know, six bucks for you to come on there. But I hope you'll stay and go through the other classes. And I hope that you will... Um, mention it to other people and bring them there for the water classes, for the sanitation classes, other things I put on and on the community side of things in the members library, there's a class that is called that we're all in this together. And it is absolutely about building community. And you must do that uh, to survive when it gets really, really bad. You need to have people around you, but you want to build that community before things break so that you're not thrown into a, wildly into a group of people that are thrown together because some of those personalities might be dangerous is what it comes down to. Uh, and so you want to choose the, um, uh, the people that you're going to be with. So you develop that community, that resilient community, which is what I like to talk about. That's why I don't, I don't, I don't talk about preparedness. I talk about provident living to me. That's the, the positive word because, Hey, you got a spare tire and a jack in your car, right? because you want to have a flat? No, it happens. So you're just living providently. You have auto insurance, health insurance, those kinds. Hey, we have food storage. We have other things because we're living providently. So that when something happens, I don't have to, I, I went to, to, I went to Winco and to our local store down here in a little town to take pictures of the empty shelves where there wasn't any toilet paper. And like, I would be more worried about what was in the front end than I am what comes out the back end. But people are all worried about that. So they strip the shelves of toilet paper. Well, also ramen noodles and everything else, which is terrible food. Stripped all the shelves in there. I got a Winco, you know, big box store, empty shelves. That was really cool. I didn't go there to buy anything. I went there to take the pictures I can show in classes. You don't want to go there when everybody's fighting over a roll of toilet paper. Uh, okay. Jim, I think maybe we ought to, okay. ought to cut it off. I'm not sure where, but uh, we're, we're losing people anyway. But uh, yeah. we'll just sign off, and, and uh, you've given everyone the information um, and, uh, you know, where they can uh, go to your website, and uh, we're, we're happy for that. And uh, uh, this presentation uh, can be viewed on the TACTA website as well. So if anyone wants to, um, you know, review the presentation and the other um, materials, they're welcome to do that. And there's also other, uh, other presentations from the past. Thank you for the opportunity and sharing and letting an old buzzard ramble on for a few minutes. Hope to talk to you all again. Sometime. That's all right. Yeah, we appreciate everyone's uh, 
uh, everyone's uh, participation and uh, hope to see you uh, uh, next month uh, at the uh, our next presentation. We'll, we'll be sending out the um, notifications. And if you uh, aren't getting the notifications, please uh, 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 contact us at info at tacta.org and we'll try to try to get you taken care of. Thank you, everyone, and have a good evening. Thank you. Good night.